Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And in the course Enzyme Structure, Enzyme Science and Technology, we are discussing about the different aspects of the enzymes. So if you recall in the previous uh, module, we have discussed about the uh, general properties of the pro uh, enzymes and then we also discuss about some of the historical aspects as, as well as the development of the field of enzymology. And in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the enzyme structures and in that context, we have discussed about the uh, primary structures, we discuss about how you can be able to determine the primary structures and we have also discussed about the different types of methods through which you can be able to determine the primary structures. So primary structure is nothing but the uh, the sequence of the amino acid in which the uh, protein is made up of and uh, these primary structures are further get folded into different types of secondary structures. So in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the secondary structures and how you can be able to determine the secondary structures of a protein. So this is what we have discussed. We have discussed about the primary structures and uh, uh, while we were discussing about the primary structures, we discussed that the primary structures can be uh, made up of, of the uh, different types of amino acids and uh, we have discussed uh, various uh, techniques through which you can be able to determine the different types of amino acids, their compositions, their sequence and all that. Now primary structures are going to be get folded and they will give you the different types of secondary structures. The most uh, classical structures of the secondary structures are alpha helix, beta sheets and as well as the turns. So what is the secondary structures? The amino acids interact with each other and as a result the peptide chain folds into the secondary structures. The secondary structures are the building blocks for the tertiary structures. So this is what we have done, right? Primary structures, secondary structures, secondary structures will, uh, you know, come together and will give you the tertiary structures. And if the protein has the different subunits, it is actually going to give you the quaternary structures. So first primary structure is the alpha helix. So alpha helix, it is a helical structure termed as the alpha helix by the great uh, scientist Linus Pauling. In this structure, the polypeptide backbone is wound around the central axis with the R group of the amino acid protrudes outward from the helix backbone. In most of the proteins, the alpha helix is right handed. Okay? So you can have the alpha helix which is right handed, you can have the alpha helix which is left handed, but all the amino acids are L amino acids, mostly the alpha helix is right handed in the most of the proteins what is present in the biological system. Uh, the second the secondary structure is called as the beta sheets. This is more extended conformation of the polypeptide chain where R groups protrude from the zigzag structure in an opposite direction giving a alternate structures and beta sheets could be uh, could be parallel beta sheets or could be anti parallel beta sheets. Now, there is a third secondary structure and the third secondary structure is called as the turns. The secondary structures have no definite structures and these are present in the protein structure to change the direction of the running polypeptide. These are also found to be places to connect the successive alpha and beta sheets. The number of amino acids and their preference in the turn is not consistent and the two protein can adopt similar 3D conformation by changing the length and keeping the amino acid in the turn region of the structures. So turn is a unstructured region or I will say a very flexible structure. So it can have the different types of amino acids. It can have no condition that these are the amino acids are not possible or so on. So this is just an overview of the different types of secondary structures. If you want to uh, read or if you want to uh, just learn more about the secondary structures, what I will suggest is that you can actually be able to consult any of the uh, biochemistry books so that it, they will actually going to, for example, the Leninger, right, or Strayer or White and White. 
so that they can actually be able to give you the different properties. So in this course, we are not discussing about the properties of these secondary structures and uh, they will tell you what will be the uh, what will the amino acid which are uh, preferentially being found in the uh, alpha helix and what are the amino acids which are preferentially will bound in the beta sheets and turns. So there is no preference for the amino acids in the turn because turn is actually a structure which connects the alpha sheets to alpha alpha helix to alpha helix and that is how it can actually be able to responsible for formation of different types of motifs and uh, it can actually connect the alpha helix to beta sheets and that also will uh, be responsible for the different types of motifs. So all these uh, alpha helix or beta sheet uh, when they come together with the help of the turn they are actually going to give you the different types of motifs and uh, there is a excellent book which is called as the uh, protein structure by the Brandon and Tools. And uh, this is very good book in case you want to explore or you want to read more about the uh, secondary structures and how the secondary structures are coming together to give you the different types of motifs. And they have given you a, a discrete, you know, different examples how the different types of uh, the secondary structures or the combination of secondary structures are present. And uh, what I will suggest is that students could actually go through with this uh, book. There is a single chapter of uh, uh, where they have actually discussed about the motifs and uh, I think it is a very good idea. Okay? So we are not going to discuss or take it into detail about the secondary structures. Now the question comes once you have the secondary structures, how you can be able to determine the secondary structure in the enzyme structures. Okay? So methods to determine the secondary structures. So experimental method, you have the two very uh, classical structures which are called CD spectroscopy and IR spectroscopy. So uh, we have two methods, one is IR, CD spectroscopy and the second is the IR spectroscopy. CD spectroscopy of the proteins and peptides. Proteins are the linear polymers made up of, of the 20 amino acids, 19 out of which except glycine because glycine does not have the side chain are chiral, right? You know that they, uh, you have a protein amino acid structure where you have the four uh, groups, right? You have the uh, carboxyl group and you have the amino group, right? So all these groups are different and that is why this carbon is a chiral carbon, right? And that is why it actually can actually be able to participate into reacting with the uh, circularly polarized light and that is how they are very much sensitive for the CD spectroscopy, but except the glycine. This chirality is also reflected in the secondary structure the, of the polypeptide chain. Okay. For UV CD spectra of proteins are typically recorded from the range of 190 to 250 nanometer. Peptide bond is the major chromophore in this region and the relative orientation of the peptide bond with respect to each other leads to the characteristic CD signal, thereby allowing the identification of the secondary structure elements. So this is actually I have given you the uh, citations. So if you want to read more about this CD spectroscopy, you can actually be able to see one of our course, which is also present on the Antiral website, and you can actually be able to read more about the content. Now, how you can be able to perform the CD spectroscopy? So, what you require? You require the following materials. So, you require a CD spectropolarimeter, right? That is the uh, instrument, right? Then you require the weighing balance. You require the pH meter so that you can be able to prepare the buffer, right? Then uh, you require the different types of reagents. So, you require a uh, phosphate buffer like 50 millimolar phosphate buffer pH 7. Uh, and then you require a protein. So, for example, in this example, we have taken an example of hen egg white lysozyme. Then we require a 0 0.5, 0 0.1 molar KCL. You require the different types of glasswares and plastic wares, such as you require the pipettes, pipette tips, 100 ml volumetric flask, so that you can be able to use that for preparing the uh, buffer. Then you require the 100 ml beaker, you require the test tubes or the 15 ml polypropylene tubes and you require a 1 mm path lens, the quad tubers. 
you have to prepare the different types of reagents. So for first reagent, what you have to prepare, you have to prepare a phosphate buffer. So prepare the 50 millimolar sodium phosphate buffer, PS7, uh, and uh, filter the buffer through a 0.22 micron filter. And if you want to learn more about how to prepare the buffers, what are the different precautions you should take, you can actually be able to see one of my um, in uh, the MOOCs course which is called as the experimental biotechnology. So experimental biotechnology is a course where I have discussed how you can be able to prepare the, uh, the buffers because when you prepare the phosphate buffer, you have to have a different combinations of the salt and the acid and that you can actually be able to uh, know from this uh, MOOCs course which is of the called as uh, experimental biotechnology. Then you also require to prepare the protein solutions, right? Uh, so you can weigh the 5 milligrams of lysozyme and dissolve it into a 500 microliter phosphate buffer. Filter the solution through the 0.22 micron filter. Take the 10 microliter of the filtered lysozyme solution and add 990 microliter of 0.1 molar KCl. Measure the absorbance of the 100 fold diluted lysozyme against 0.1 molar KCl. So that actually is going to tell you what will be the concentration of the protein. So you can estimate the concentration of the lysozyme stock solutions using the formula absorbance is equal to uh, extension coefficients into the C right and it into the uh, path length and into the dilution factors. So you can dilute the lysozyme stock solution to prepare a 20 microgram per mmol solution in a uh, 50 millimolar phosphate buffer solutions, okay? Because this is the working protein solutions. So whatever the precision you will take, right? For example, you weigh the 5 milligrams and dissolve it into 500 microliter buffer that may or may not be correct. So to make it more precise, what you can do is you can just take the small aliquot of the protein, dissolve it into the you know 100 folds or 10 folds whatever the case and then you take the absorbance and when you take that absorbance use that absorbance to calculate the concentrations and that is actually going to be more and more accurate because if you take too much protein it is actually going to interfere in recording the CD spectro uh, CD spectra or if you take very diluted the uh, you will not get the signature sequences a signature pattern. After this, uh, you have to follow the complete protocols. So in the procedure, you have to first, you have to turn on the spectroprolimeter, right? And then you have to purge the spectroprolimeter optical compartment with a nitrogen gas at 10 liter per minute for 15 minutes. I, as long as the instrument is on, there should be a uninterrupted nitrogen supply. So this means you require either a nitrogen generator right if you want to purchase an instrument which will have inbuilt nitrogen generator or you actually require a nitrogen cylinder right so that you can be able to connect right because why we are working in the nitrogen because we want to work in the inert environment then you turn on the lamp of the spectrophotometer turn on the other parts of the spectrophotometer and the computer and allow the 30 minutes to warm up. This 30 minute is required because you want to stabilize the, uh, the intensity of the light, intensity of the, uh, you know, the bulb, okay? Because bulbs normally take some time to get stabilized. Then you can open the spectra collecting softwares, set the uh, half wavelength between 1 to 1.5 nanometer and then you set the wavelength range. So wavelength range can be from 260 to 185 nanometer and uh, it's suitable for the 0.1 to 0.2 milligram protein solutions in the buffer and that does not absorb in this range. So you have to first take the control buffer solution as well so that you will know what will be the absorptivity of the buffers in that particular range. You can set the number of scans to 8. Okay, This means that the final spectra will be average of the eight different spectra, which means you are going to asking the instrument to do a eight scans and then show you a average of those eight, eight scans. Define the path in the software for storing the uh, structure, which means you are going to define uh, where you should actually store the 
uh, files, right? Then you set the wavelength interval, for example, in the signal to noise ratio 20 is to 1, a 0.5 nanometer is the optimal interval. If the signal to noise ratio is low, the interval can be set as uh, 0, 1 or 0.2 nanometer. Set the data collection time at each interval to 1 second. Set the instrument time constant to 100 milliseconds. Then set the instrument to record the electricity and the PMT voltage. Then you take the 200 microliter of filtered phosphate buffer in the 1 millimeter path length quartz cubit, right? Record the CDs while monitoring the PMT voltage. PMT voltage increases as the instrument scans, scans the lower wavelength. If the PMT voltage goes above 500 volt, the spectra becomes noisy and less reliable. In that case, the protein solution need to be diluted or the spectra be recorded to a higher wavelength such as 190 or 195 nanometer. So, PMT is very important, right? And PMT is should not go beyond 500 because if it goes beyond 500, then it is actually going to give you a uh, the spectra which is less reliable. Remove the buffer from the cubit and add 200 microliter of 20 microgram per ml lysozyme solution. Remember that in the previous step, we have discussed about how to prepare the lysozyme solutions. Then you record the CD spectra for the protein solutions. Subtract the blank spectra from the recorded protein spectra to obtain the corrected protein spectra. So, this is actually in the step 1 we have correct we have first collected the spectra for the buffer that will be the blank spectra and then we have step 2 we have collected the spectra for the protein. So, that is the uh, you know the protein spectra and then you have to subtract the buffer spectra from the protein spectra and that is going to give you the corrected protein spectra. Then you save the corrected protein spectra as the Excel uh, as a text file, okay, so that you can be able to use that for the in the next step for analysis. So in the CD spectra, what are the results and analysis, okay? So most CD spectra and will generate the data in the case of in the form of elasticity, okay? Elasticity. So, CD value of the protein and peptides are generally reported as the mean residue elasticity values in degrees centimeter square and per mole. Okay? Convert the corrected spectra into the text file using the CD spectra softwares. Then open the text file using a computing and graphing software such as the Microsoft Excel or the Arigin, right? And then you calculate the mean residue elasticity at each wavelength using the following formula. So, you can use the following formula and it is actually going to give you the, the calculation of the mean residue elasticity at each wavelength. Okay? And then you can actually be able to plot the mean residue elasticity as a function of wavelength to obtain the far UV CD spectrum. Okay? So, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about what are different types of reagent is required to collect the CD spectra of a protein or the enzyme and then what are the different uh, process you have to uh, perform. But this is somewhat virtual. So, I would like to take you to the CD spectrometry uh, facility and where the uh, people are going to show you a demo. This demo is going to be prepared by one of the my colleague uh, in like uh, and he is going to show you the CD spectroscopy, okay. Welcome to the demonstration of uh, CD spectrometer. I am Dr. Nathan Chaudhary, a professor at the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. This is CD spectrocolorimeter from JASCO and this is what we will be using for recording the electronic CD spectrum for some proteins or peptides. A far UV CD spectrum is mostly used for studying the secondary structural elements in a protein or peptide sample. In the far UV region, it is very essential that you flush out all the oxygen that is present inside the instrument because the ozone lamp, the xenon lamp would generate ozone gas and ozone is actually detrimental for the optics of the spectrum. So with the CD instrument, we also have a nitrogen generator which will filter out the oxygen from the atmosphere and generate nitrogen. So you can flush that nitrogen gas through the instrument 
and then only you turn on the lamp of the instrument. The flow rate of the nitrogen gas can be controlled from here and typically a 5 liters per minute of nitrogen flow is essential. So what we do is we turn on the nitrogen generator, leave it to flow through the instrument at 5 liters per minute for at least 20 minutes and then only we turn on the spectrum. Once ready, we will open the software that is used for recording the spectrum. This is the Spectra Manager software from JASCO. So what we do? We go to Spectra Measurement. Here, open this up. Okay. So you set up all the parameters in this uh, software spectrum manager. You set up what range of wavelength you are going to record your spectrum. You select the slip weights, you select the scan speed and you also select the digital integration time for your data. Once you are done with that, you also have to select the number of accumulations. CD spectra are generally uh, low, they have low signal to noise ratio. So to improve the signal to noise ratio, you record multiple spectra and the average of those spectra is presented as the final data. So this is the chamber where you place your cuvette. The cuvettes used for CD spectra spectroscopy are quartz cuvettes because you are working in the UV range and glass strongly, strong, strongly absorbs the UV radiation so you need quartz. This is the cuvette chamber. So what you are seeing here, these are the adapters which I am taking out right now. You can see them. So once you take out the adapters, you will see that you can easily fit a one centimeter path length cuvette in this sample chamber. A one centimeter path length cuvette is generally used for near UV CD, which is weak in intensity. But for far UV signal, for far UV CD, you typically use a one millimeter path length cell. So you have these two adapters. You place them in the cuvette chamber and you simply sandwich your 1 mm path and cross cuvette between them and put it here. The volume of the 1 cm path and quartz cuvette is roughly around 200 microliters. That means you need 200 microliters of sample for doing the far UV series spectroscopy. Okay. So you place your sample here and start recording your series spectrum. This is the instrument and CD Spectra Colorimeter is controlled by this software, Spectra Manager. So you just click on this uh, shortcut for the Spectra Manager and there are different options available for recording CD. What we are going to do is, we are going to record Spectrum. So we click on Spectra Measurement. Here you will set up the parameters that you use for recording CD spectrum. You click on measure and go to parameters. So generally when you record CD spectrum, you record two channels. Channel 1 is CD and channel 2 is high tension HD voltage. You can set up the wavelengths here. We will be recording the CD spectrum from 250 to 195 nanometers. This is the far UV region where absorbance is largely because of the peptide bond. The far UV region of CD will give you information about the secondary structures of proteins. We will be keeping the data pitch 0.5 nanometers. That means you will be having CD values after every 0.5 nanometers. You can set up the scanning speed which is 100 nanometers per minute. We are recording in continuous mode and you can have this digital integration time as 2 seconds. The bandwidth for this experiment we are choosing 5 nanometers. Now CD signals are weak so signal to noise ratio is not very good. So you generally need to record a number of scans and CD instrument gives you the average of those scans. So here we are taking 4 scans, 4 accumulations for each CD spectrum. So we set it ok.
now when you click on start measurement it asks me to give the sample name so i am putting this as sample 1 in fact first you have to record blank which will be your solvent or buffer whatever you have dissolved your you, you for dissolving your protein write the blank and say okay as soon as i say okay the spectrum will be recorded so now what i will do is i will be placing the solvent which in this case is water in this case so for far uv cv spectrum we use quartz fluid which has a 1 mm path length we use quartz fluid because we are working in the uv region and we cannot use glass as glass strongly absorbs the uv radiation so this is the fluid for 1 mm path length i will now be adding buffer or the solvent whatever solvent we use in this case a 200 microliter volume is generally sufficient for recording cv Get the cuvette and gently push down the solvent, ensuring that no bubble enters in the cuvette. You can gently tap the cuvette to get a nice meniscus in the bar. You can then wipe the surfaces using a lint-free tissue paper. Place this cube now in the sample chamber. Like this. Cover the sample chamber. Close the lid and click on OK. So now the spectrum will start getting recorded. And we have done four accumulations for each spectrum, so you can see the instrument is recording accumulation number one out of four. And you can see this spectrum getting recorded in real time. So this is the first accumulation. As you can see, so this is the channel. The top channel is for CD, and the bottom channel is for HD. So what happens is when you place your sample, and when the uh, CD gets recorded. your sample is actually absorbing photons as the sample absorbs photon less number of photons will reach the detector so a higher voltage is applied to the detector to get more secondary electrons by the pmp so essentially the light get extinguished by your samples and a high higher voltage is applied so when the absorbance of the sample becomes too high very few photons reach the detector because very few electrons reach the detector a higher voltage is applied to amplify the signal and this is where the problem is so a very high voltage is applied when there are very few electrons very few photons reaching the detector so under those conditions when very few photons reach the detector your signal becomes noisy and it becomes reliable so one has to ensure that the cd voltage never exceeds 600 voltage to get a Reliable CD spectrum. It's not problem at all. So now this spectra is recorded, and we can save this data in some directory. So let me just save it as blank. So now I'll be recording the CD spectrum for a protein which we expect to be largely alpha D. Let us see how this spectra works. So this is a protein sample. I am putting protein. I click on OK, and the spectrum will
Now, once you collected the CD spectra, okay, the CD spectra is going to be look like like this. So, where you have plotted the electricity and the wavelength on the one side. So, the peptide bond actually constitute the major protein chromophore in the far UV region. The absorbance in the far UV region is the manifestation of N2 pi transition around 220 nanometer and the pi to pi transitions below the 210 nanometers. The orientation of the peptide bond in the secondary structure element greatly influence their CD signal. Okay? Let us have a look at the characteristic CD spectra of the uh, major secondary structure component present in the uh, proteins. So, what you see here is that we have shown you the CD spectra of the different secondary structure elements. Okay? So, when you do it for the protein, you will not get the exclusive for the alpha helix, beta sheets or turns, you will actually going to get a complex pattern. So, what you are going to expect if it is a alpha helix protein. Okay? For the alpha helix, the CD spectrum of a right handed alpha helix is characterized by the two negative absorption band of nearly same intensity centered around 222 nanometer which means uh, which means uh, this right so this is the negative region of the first peak which you are going to expect in the alpha helix and then you are going to have this is this is coming because of the n to pi transitions and then you are also going to have another dip which is actually 208 nanometer and that is because of the pi to pi transition. So, this is the 208 transition. Okay? And a relatively more intense band around 192 nanometer that is going to be because of the pi to pi interactions. Okay? So, that is this one. Okay? Now, if it is a beta sheet, for example, okay, so beta sheets display a negative band centered around 216 to 218 nanometer. This arises due to the N to pi transition and a positive band of the comparable intensity at 195 nanometer arises due to the pi to pi interactions. So, this is the beta sheets. What you see here is one transition which is uh, one transition which is this, right? This is the uh, uh, 216 to 218 nanometer. This is the and then you are also going to see another transition which is at the 195 nanometer. Now, if it is a beta turn is a four residue protein motif that causes the polypeptide backbone to take a turn of approximately 180 degree. So, beta turn do not have a well defined spectral signals. A typical beta turn however show a weak negative signal around 225 nanometer arises due to the n to pi transitions, a strong positive band between 200 to 205 and a strong negative band which is arises from the pi to pi transitions between the 180 to 190 nanometer. And then we have the random coils. So, this is the random coil. So, random coils, random coils or the unordered protein structures display a weak positive band around 218 nanometer arises due to the n to pi transitions and a strong negative band which is arises due to the pi to pi transitions below 200 nanometer. Okay? So, this is what it is showing. So, this is below 200 nanometer what you are expecting in the unstructured uh, sorry this is the uh, what you see okay and uh, in the random coils okay now once you got the cd spectra okay so once you got the cd spectra of the proteins okay you are actually going to use that for and suppose you have corrected the back back um, blank and all that you are going to get the corrected soft data, right? That corrected one you can actually be able to put into the CD Spectra, CD Pro software suit, and that is actually going to tell you the percentage of the alpha helix, percentage of the beta sheets, and so on. So there is a there is a lot of analysis what you can do. So CD Pro is a suit of program developed by the uh, 
uh, these scientists and they have analyzed the far UVC D data. The suit contains the three programs. It's called Cellcon, Contil, and the CDSSTR, and it is freely available at this particular uh, link. And the information about the algorithm and these program use can be found elsewhere. Okay, so this is I have given you the link for. Uh, you know, for the, uh, the for the reference of this uh, CD Pro program, and uh, when we were going to show you the CD Spectra demo, that time we are also going to show you how to use the CD Pro software and uh, to analyze the data also. Now, once you are doing the CD Spectra, okay, you have to follow the different types of precautions. What are the precautions you have to take? Number one, you have to use the buffer which, which is going to be of very high quality and that is going to be used for the CD spectroscopy is free of any optically active elements because more and more optically active elements are going to be present. They are actually going to increase your background. Okay, So the buffer has to be transparent in the far UV region as possible. Water alone is the most transparent solvent but absence of salt may result in the denaturation of the certain proteins. It is necessary to determine the concentration of the protein very accurately for obtaining the high quality CD data. Okay? And we have shown you, right? even if you have prepared very precisely by dissolving the 5 milligrams of protein in 0.5 ml of phosphate buffer, that may or may not correct. because the there could be some issue with the weighing and all that. So whenever you want to do a CT spectroscopy, it is important that you take the absorbance at 280 nanometer and use that with the extension coefficient of that particular protein and uh, to calculate the uh, accurate uh, concentration of the protein. Then instrument time constant is the measure of how quickly an instrument respond to an input. The instrument constant of 100 millisecond is usually sufficient for the routine CT spectroscopy. The instrument response time should not be greater than the one tenth of the data collection time at each time point. Okay? The PMT which is very important, right? so PMT detector will produce current in response to the incoming photons. Most CD spectro uh, polymeter works in the constant current mode. As the wavelength decreases, the absorbance increases, thereby causes the lesser number of photon reaching the detector. This results in the increase in the PMT voltage so as to maintain the constant current. Right? As the PMT voltage crosses the 500 volt, which means you are actually providing the current externally because the because the uh, photon which are reaching to the detector is decreasing. Okay, the spectra becomes noisy and less reliable because now what is happening is that the signal from the sample is very less, and that's why to make it more detectable, you are providing, you are increasing the in current. Okay, so if you increase a huge amount of current it is becoming the spectra becomes noisy and less reliable. In such cases, the sample is diluted so that the absorbance of the sample decreases. If the PMT is still high, the spectra should be recorded up to a relatively higher wavelength, which means if the PMT is more than 500, okay, it could be because you are taking a protein or the enzyme uh, which is of very high concentrations and because it has a very high concentration, it is absorbing very strongly in that particular area and that is why it is actually not allowing the large quantity of uh, the photon to reach to the detector and because the detector current is going down as a corrective measurement, the PMT is increasing the current. So that is actually can be avoided if you want to lower down the concentration of the enzyme. So this is all about the CD spectroscopy. What we have discussed, we have discussed about the general principle of the CD spectroscopy. And I would suggest that if you want to read more about the principles and other things, we I have given you the link for the NPTEL uh, web course 
and there we have given you the complete content. And then we also discuss about how to perform the CD spectroscopy and uh, my colleague uh, Professor Chaudhary has also shown you a complete demo about how to record the CD spectroscopy and how you can be able to analyze the CD spectra. Now let's move on to the next uh, method and the next method of detecting the determining the secondary structure is the IR spectroscopy. Now, IR spectroscopy of the proteins and peptides. IR spectroscopy also utilizes the peptide bond for the secondary structure determinations. The peptide group results in the nine absorption uh, bands labeled as A, B and 1 to 7 amide. One is the most useful IR spectra. Okay band in analyzing the polypeptide backbone conformations. It arises largely due to the carbonyl stretching vibration with a small contribution from the CN stretching and the NH bending and vibration and appear between the 700 to 1600 uh, centimeter minus 1. The precise frequency of vibration is determined by the nature of hydrogen bond that is the carbonyl uh, group and the NH group are involved in. The nature of the hydrogen bond, the, the backbone amide chain are involved in dependent on the conformation of the polypeptide backbone. It should be therefore possible to determine the secondary structure of the protein from the frequencies present in the uh, amide 1 bond. Okay? And we have given you the link for this uh, particular course. So, this is the content where we are actually going to discuss about the principle of the IR spectroscopy and, uh, and it is actually going to give you more detail. What I am discussing right now is a uh, little summary of what we have discussed in the, uh, in the NPTEL web courses. So, what you see here is that the absorption band of the protein secondary structure element in the water. So, polypeptide conformation if it is a alpha helix, it is actually going to give you a way absorbance in the range of 1657 to 1648. If it is a beta sheet, it is going to give you an absorbance at 1641 to 1623. If it is a unordered structure, which means it can be uh, the turns or loops then it is actually going to give you an absorbance in the range of 1657 to 1642. And if it is a anti-parallel beta sheets, it is actually going to give you a absorbance in the range of 1695 to 1675. Now, how to perform the uh, IR spectroscopy of the proteins and peptides? So what material you require? You require uh, FTIR spectrophotometers you require the hydraulic press, you require the weighing balance. You require a proteins, for example, in this case, we have also taken another example where we have used the hen egg white lysozymes. You require the KBR, so it KBR should be of very high grade, which means the IR grade. Then you require the DTU, you require DCL, you require NAOD, and you require the different types of glasswares and plasticware such as the pipettes, pipette tips, 1.5 ml, microcentrifuge tube, pestle and mortar. And this is what you are supposed to do the procedures. So these are the instrument you require, right? So you dry the KBR in hot air oven to remove any moisture. Remember that the water is actually very much IR active, okay? And that's why the water, if the amount of water is present, it is actually going to reduce the signal and it is actually going to make, uh, it, it, it may mask some of the signal, okay. So that's why it, the water has to be removed and that's why we are using the KBR as the uh, solvent actually or it's KBR as the medium where we are actually going to prepare the sample because KBR is going to be IR inactive molecule. You take out the dried KBR powder and you weigh the 60 milligrams of KBR. Okay? You grind the KBR in a pestle mortar to obtain a very fine powder. Prepare the KBR pellet using a dye and hydraulic press. So this is the dye and hydraulic press. 
then you prepare the 10 ml of 50 millimolar NaCl solution in the D2O. If required, you adjust the pH to 7 using the uh, using the uh, deuterium chloride or the sodium deuterate, deuteroxide. So, this means you are going to use a deuterium derivative of the uh, HCl and NaOH. Weigh the accurately 5 milligrams of protein and dissolve it in 1 ml of the prepared NaCl solutions. This is the working protein sample. Okay. Then you switch on the IR spectrophotometry and allow it 30 minutes to warm up. Remember that for every spectrophotometer, whether it is the CD fluorimeter or IR spectrometer, uh, a, a minimum amount of uh, uh, the warm up is required. Okay. So, for example, uh, most of the time we turn on the instrument for 30 minutes so that the intensity of the bulb should be stabilized. Place the 20 microliter of 10 millimolar NAC solution in DTO in the center of the KBR pellet. Dry the pellet in a vacuum desiccator for 10 minutes. Set the spectrometer in the absorbance mode and the data acquisition range in the range of 200 to 2000 to 1000 centimeter minus 1 and record the spectra with 64 scan at 4 uh, centimeter minus resolution and save the file as blank which means first you are going to take the spectra of the only reagents or only buffer okay then what you are going to do is you are going to uh, prepare the KBR pellet. Okay. So, you prepare another KBR pellet using the same amount of KBR okay, and that will be the blank. Then you place the 20 microliter of protein solution in the center of the KBR pellet. You dry the pellet in the vacuum desiccator for 10 minutes. Then you record the spectra with 64 scan and save the file as protein which means you are going to have the two files. You are going to have the blank file which we have generated in the previous uh, file right this is the blank file what we have generated in the previous step and then you are going to have another file which is going to be the protein file. Now how you are going to uh, analyze these files so you open the blank and the protein spectra using the any graphing software such as Microsoft Excel or the origin you subtract the absorbance value in the blank spectra from those in the protein spectra which means you are actually going to subtract the whatever the value you are getting from the protein and you are going to subtract the blank so that you are actually going to get the corrected uh, protein spectra. Plot the subtracted absorbance against the wavelength this will give you the IR spectra of the proteins. Okay. The peak that appears in the 1700 to 600 minus 1600 region corresponds to the amide 1 band of the proteins. So, what you see here is that is the typical uh, IR spectra of the proteins. Okay. And what you see here is that you are going to have the peak. These are the peaks, right? So, this is the amide 1 peak, this is the amide 2 peak, which you are going to get and you are going to have get the some more peaks also. Now, how you are going to analyze this? You are going to analyze this in a, uh, so the amide band, one band will show two overlapping band with the maxima as the 1634 and the 1655. The spectrum indicate that the polypeptide has both alpha helix and the beta sheet conformations. It is useful to obtain a double derivative or deriv derivative of the band for resolving the overlapping bands. Now, once you are done with the IR spectroscopy, uh, you also have to take a lot of precautions uh, while you are doing the IR spectroscopy. So, what are the precautions? Only IR spectroscopy grade KBR should be used for making the pellets. Okay, If you use the KBR of the lower grades, it is actually going to give you the IR spectra of the interfering agents. Synthetic peptide which means the small peptide what you are going to synthesize in your laboratory right usually have the TFA as the lone pair which means it is going to have the bound TFA. So, TFA absorb at this particular wavelength that is the 1674 and should be there be exchanged by an IR inactive anion so that 
you can be able to get the values for this particular wavelength as well. Otherwise, the TFA is going to interfere in collecting the correct spectra. This is usually achieved by dissolving the peptide in 5 millimolar SCL followed by freezing in liquid nitrogen and finally lyophilizing. Repeating this process provides the peptide sufficiently good for the IR spectroscopy. Okay. So what we have discussed, we have discussed about the primary structures, we have discussed about the secondary structures, within the secondary structure we have discussed about the alpha helix, we have discussed about the beta sheets and we have also discussed about the turns and uh, we have also discussed about the two methods, we have discussed about the CD spectra and we have also discussed about the IR spectroscopy to, um, to determine the secondary structures. So in this particular lecture, we have discussed about the secondary structures, we have discussed about how you can determine the secondary structures and so on. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss about how you can be able to determine the tertiary structures and what are the different methods through which you can be able to determine the tertiary structures. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. In our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss more about the tertiary structures of the enzyme. Thank you. Mm -hmm.